Dr. Hertzkowitz's extensive training includes a, a medicine degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, residency in pathology and internal medicine, and fellowship training in cardiology at the John Hopkins Medical Center. At John Hopkins, Dr. Hertzkowitz was duly appointed to medicine and molecular microbiology, immunology, writing more than 110 publications and book chapters in fields of cardiology, immunology, and autoimmunity and microbiology. Over the past 15 years, he has been clinical professor at the of medicine at the University of California at San Francisco and co-founder and chief medical officer of the Institute for One World Health, the first nonprofit pharmaceutical company in the United States. He is now director and founder of the Ant Antera, which is a um, holistic clinic. He also has acupunctures there, naturopaths. Um, so he has a very well-versed uh, group of people there. So it's not just M MDs, but there are other disciplines in that group. And he has developed a personalized way of uh, proactive medicine based on convergence of seven vital disciplines. Here's Dr. Avi Herskowitz. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bert. Um, first, I want to say that this is the first coherent explanation I've heard in a long time about why, from Elise, why most of us want to drink heavily at night. <clears throat> because uh, we want to clear the debris from our brains by having the diuretic effect from the alcohol clear the CSF and so on. So that's, that's a very coherent explanation. And, and, uh, and I also have been trying to convince Bernd to come to the office every single day because he's clearly the most knowledgeable and entertaining person in the clinic, including myself. So the patients ask him all the real questions and so on. And, the question that I first wanted to address is um, uh, is why I'm here. You know, how is it someone with my particular background uh, comes to this type of a forum and, and ends up in this environment? And I think the, the story is interesting. But first, I also want to thank uh, the leadership of SVHI and for inviting me, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, this has been an interesting journey for me. And when I uh, was raised in, in Brooklyn and, and went to Brooklyn College and, and so on, and then went into medical school, I decided from a European background that I wanted to train like European physicians trained. So after I finished medical school, um, I wanted to, to try to get a doctorate degree, but I couldn't afford it uh, because PhD students don't make any uh, income, and I, I had to pay for my tuition costs and so on. So I decided to do a residency, uh, a one-year residency in anatomical pathology. Well, that ended up to be a four-year uh, exercise because it was by far the most exciting uh, training period of my life. Uh, at that time, and this is in the late 70s, 37 years ago, uh, followers and supporters of Albert Einstein came from all over the world to become uh, faculty at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And at that point, they were already in their 80s, and some of them were even in their 90s. And they would come to, in this case, to the basement and would train the younger pathologists like myself. And we had the, the European, the Austrian, you know, Hans Popper, who wrote the, the book on liver pathology, uh, Angrist, who wrote uh, pulmonary pathology, uh, uh, others that wrote kidney pathology work, and so on, training uh, us youngsters sitting on bar stools next to the autopsy table, handling uh, organs with their hands because that's what they did in those days, and being uniquely observational and teaching us what we knew and what we also didn't know. So we were really uh, exposed, I was exposed from the very, very uh, first time that I entered medicine into uh, being, it's being, it's okay to say what we don't know, what we, what we don't know. But at the same time, there's a renaissance period uh, evolving in all the different fields, particularly in immunology and neurology and neurophysiology and, and virology and infectious disease. But so we had the opportunity to train everyone in the hospital because CT scans just came out, but no one knew how to read them. 
because no one had three-dimensional uh, slices of the human body before. So they would come, they would come down to the autopsy room. And that was the, the finest um, three, th four-year period of my career, but it taught me how to become a, detec a detective and uh, also gave me specialized training in immunopathology. So I went into, when I went back into medicine, the joke was that you didn't want me to be your internal medicine doctor because I'll want to do an autopsy on you. But that really wasn't my gig anyway. So, uh, uh, but I went to Yale and we had the AIDS epidemic uh, and learned uh, from the leadership in virology and microbiology and so it merged into more of an immunology perspective. And, and then in, in cardiology, it was the beginning, those progressive thinkers, to think about cardiovascular disease as an inflammatory condition rather than a lipid condition. So we were able to fuse those things together when I entered uh, cardiology at Hopkins from an immunology perspective. Um, then there was heart transplantation came on board and so on and and uh, and 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 then I ended up doing a, a cardiovascular laboratory in immunology working with one of the leaders in the world of autoimmunity Noel Rose is uh, was the the founder of the work on Hashimoto's and and the immunogenetics of autoimmune disease namely you could a hundred of us could be exposed to diff to the to the same virus and only a few of us will get sick and a few of us will get very sick, and most of us won't even know we've ever been exposed. So the immunogenetics of this came forward and, and entered my realm of consciousness. Um, when, uh, when I asked the chairman of cardiology why he allowed someone from Brooklyn College, not from an Ivy League school and without a PhD degree to enter his program, he said, you came very highly recommended from people you've irritated. Uh, because uh, I would say, but you know, under the microscope, it looks like this, you know, and this patient doesn't quite fit this pattern. They said, no, the diagnosis is this. I said, well, it doesn't quite fit the pattern because when you get deeper and deeper, you realize every one of us is an individual. And when we use the categories of diagnoses, they're useful tools, but there are, there are tools. They're not black and white uh, measures of any kind. And it's not even close to being uh, a reality for most illnesses that, that are gray zone illnesses. Um, so everyone who has irritable bowel syndrome, everyone that has inflammatory bowel syndrome, they all look different uh, under the microscope and, and under, the, uh, under the, the, the investigation of true individual th types of therapy. Um, so after a dozen or so years at Hopkins, um, I also had experience with the transplant patients who would never get transplant because we didn't do enough of them and they had poor blood types. They had some reason that they would never get it. So that means that they would simply die. So that wasn't acceptable to some of us. So we had to investigate different avenues. So one of the things that we did was sent them to the, in those days, to the, one of the premier nutritional centers in the world, and that was the Pritikin Institute in Chicago. And, um, and then sent them to, to an to a acupuncture college that was in Columbia, Maryland. That was one of the few centers that practiced a more ancient form of acupuncture called five element acupuncture, the one that I ultimately trained in later on in life. And some of these folks had um, autoimmune disorders that affected their hearts and affected their livers and kidneys, and they actually improved and got off the transplant list. And I said, this is, not, this is impossible because these are simply needles. How could you immunomodulate someone with a needle? So I began that type of a journey. It ultimately, 15 years later, led me to, to want to train in it because the philosophy behind it was pristine and natural and I'll discuss it later, but the effects were very, very intriguing, that you could get down to a cellular level, down to an immunological modulatory level by, by understanding someone's archetype and dealing with which windows to open first and in what order. That, that is a profound observation. And when I, when I described that observation at Johns Hopkins Grand Rounds uh, in 1994, a year before I left, 
Um, and I blinded the, 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 the graphs showing, uh, showing patients immunological data before an intervention and after an intervention showing the reality of those people getting better having immune markers that were depressed. Uh, then I unblinded and said the intervention was five element acupuncture. My chairman took me aside and said, Herskowitz, if you ever want to become full professor here, you'll never give a talk like that again. So I stopped th that type of discussion, even though I thought it was intriguing and all the people following liver and kidney patients should know about it. So fast forward to, to San Francisco, arriving here almost 20 years ago, I became director of, of a cardiovascular research institute that took me throughout, throughout Europe. And, realized, and particularly, we had a lot of centers. The best centers we had in the world doing research in cardiac surgery were in Germany. And uh, whenever I went there and I walked around and I went into pharmacies, I realized that the pharmacists were not like our pharmacists. They were homeopathists. They were herbalists. They were naturopathic trained practitioners. And the stuff that they gave me uh, worked. So it opened up my, uh, my consciousness to the to reality that I had never been exposed to before, uh, coming from a purely academic environment. Uh, not exposed to this, and opened up the possibilities and kept in my in my in my uh, uh, memory. Uh, after running this foundation and getting into a, an argument with the board directors on whether or not we were to we were to try to prevent people from needing cardiac surgery versus knowing how to treat them following cardiac surgery, I uh, me and my my wife my my wife decided to do something more on a global level. And we co-founded the Institute for One World Health with the, with the vision that we would create a nonprofit pharmaceutical entity that would do work in neglected diseases and rare diseases. When George Bush came into power, we realized that we couldn't do all the diseases we wanted to do because women's health was at the top of the list. And we didn't feel that that was a good thing to start a new organization with. And so we decided to focus on neglected diseases of the, of the developing world of the impoverished and took it forward and ultimately got large-scale funding from the Gates Foundation to do this. And a one-year exercise turned into eight years. And that took me throughout Asia and absorbing the different traditions in, um, in um, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam, Taiwan, Japan, throughout that part of the world exercised my, my again, expanded my, my consciousness even further. So when I left the global health space in 2009, I realized that in the, glo in the global health world, we were focusing on things like cholera, diarrhea, and, and, and malaria, things that we don't have here. And yet, as the, those economies will grow, they'll have the same diseases that we have here. And so global health in the future, even in that part of the world, will become the same type of health that we have to deal with here. So I wanted to, to pursue what I, what I would consider a vision for the future of medicine. And that's where I come today. So four or five years ago, I knew no one in the Bay Area in integrative medicine. I, I had no idea what even the term really meant because it, it still is unclear to me what the term means. Um, and so I decided to, to call it something different because my own vision was to use the different traditions and say the hypothesis was is that the level of toxicity that our systems are exposed to today is too great for any one single tradition, whether it's functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, homeopathic medicine, uh, uh, any form, individual form of medicine would be able to handle. And so I called it Convergence Medicine and uh, wrote a single page on Wikipedia, and there it goes. I mean, that, that's what it is today. And, and ultimately, I want to share that experience with you today. Um, but having said that, I wish I had uh, met uh, Bernd years before then. He would have expanded my horizons and, and expanded the, the, yeah. So here we go. This is from um, my colleague at Johns Hopkins, who, who clearly to me is, was, had then become over time the, the most famous cardiologist in the country. 
running all the mega trials. Dr. Topol uh, is now head of the, 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 the genetics arm of the Scripps Institute and is a now a more uh, expansive thinker in terms of medicine today. And this is, a, I think, a very um, accurate quote. Dr. Brawley is uh, an African-American physician who works out of the public hospital in, in, uh, in Atlanta, the largest single public hospital in Atlanta in, in the United States. And he's the, he was, when he wrote this, he, he was the president of the American Cancer Society. And that was intriguing to me that he had the nuts to do this, and he did, and he wrote this lovely book. But the concept is, is, is again, uh, becoming, some leadership is, are not afraid to, to discuss this in an open way. But some 250 years ago, this quote from Voltaire, it was pretty, is, uh, is, is a fairly negative statement, but, but to a certain extent it has some truth to it. And the reason it's all coming to a head today in this particular communication between myself and the audience is because we clearly live in experimental times. And the discussion that we had earlier in terms of EMF exposure and so on is, is just one of the many, 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 many different variables that have now been exponentially increased over the last few decades. And so we have a longer and longer list of stuff that our systems have to be accustomed to and be able to excrete, excrete and eliminate and, and, uh, and metabolize. And the list is unfortunately not going to, to shorten any time quickly. So uh, what I want to discuss and, and enter into a dialogue today with everyone is, is a strategy, a strategic approach that one would have to think through. Some of it is already well known to this esteemed audience. And some of it may, may be a bit of a different perspective of the same topics that you think about every day. But I also knew that some of my own patients would be here th this evening, so I wanted them to get a good flavor as well. So that's the exercise I want to go through. As Robert said, we have trillions of cells. I really don't know what the correct number is. I don't think anyone has a clue, but there are certainly many, many cells, okay? Whether it's a hundred trillion or five trillion, I don't know. I, I don't know if that makes any difference. And of course, this leads to a tremendous level of complexity. But I want to entertain tonight that we, we as an audience collectively, we cannot fathom the level of complexity. Um, we simplify the level of complexity all the time, but the level of complexity is is. Um, mind-boggling and I'll be able if I had we had a video I'll be able to show some things to you but we don't have access to it but we'll get into it there, there are 12,000 medical illnesses in our databases today and we know that over the last 30 40 years a certain portion of them have risen exponentially whether it's autism as you all know autoimmune disorders immunological disorders inflammatory disorders uh, metabolic disorders, they're exploding in, in prevalence. And the question is why? And of course, you go back to these, uh, these experimental times and you can, you can come up with a reasonable set of hypotheses that we're not dealing with this uh, new experimental time very well because we've just, we haven't had a chance to adapt to it yet. We haven't had a chance to strategically address it in a, in a coherent and, and comprehensive way nor have we been able to teach anyone uh, how, to, how to deal with it, and nor are we able to, to even address it ourselves and communicate it uh, intelligently with, uh, within our own communities. Um, and I'll address that later on in the talk. So if you want to take this particular um, diagram, this is hard, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to see the, the writing on it. it this is, looks like, a, like an Intel circuit, but this is uh, representing about some 11,000 pathways known within an individual cell. So this is now repeated 10, 100 trillion times in the system. And then it interacts with the extracellular space. So it, this, the level of complexity and the miracle that it, this, this thing functions even when we're ill is 
pretty um, uh, mind-boggling. That's fine. It was fine. It was just we'll repeat. Yeah, it, we don't need to see it. So here we have, in my opinion, um, some of the the concepts. If we look at things on a system level, without necessarily thinking about things as a subspecialist, whether it's cardiovascular or rheumatology or gastroenterology or neurology, looking at it in terms of uh, uh, biological systems, we we know. We know very little about the immune system, metabolic, digestive, or elimination pathways. Thank you so much. We know a little bit more about these other functions here. And we think we understand um, the easy stuff. The easy stuff is on the cardiac side is simply plumbing or the pump and the filtration side in the kidneys. Um, and I and I and I think that this this is these are the two best understood systems that we currently have because they're m somewhat mechanical and understandable when uh, when you analyze it. But how do you mine the vast uh, numbers of uh, of data points? Well, as Dr. Topol is in charge of uh, this digitization of medicine at the Scripps um, and at the national level. He, he's preparing us to think about the use of in artificial intelligence, taking all of the continuous data streams that we will all collect on our, iP on our iPhones in the future, collectively put it into a mass set of databases that will look at natural history of all of our daily lives. And as we get more sophisticated, not just measuring pulse, but measuring uh, all the different metabolic functions on whether it's on our iPhones or on our toilet seats, which the technology, the, the cutting edge technology, of course, comes from Japan, because people like to know exactly what they need to do there uh, um, as soon as they pee in the morning. So, but how does one interpret all this data? And right now we're limited to clinical trials, and these are the arguments that are made against, uh, against uh, alternative medicine that you guys don't do placebo-controlled, double-blinded trials. And I'll explain why that's nonsense, relatively nonsense, because uh, the trials aren't designed uh, very, very intelligently. And the drivers of disease are poorly understood. This ultimately is the reason why the pharmaceutical industry is now failing in productivity. Because when I trained um, in cardiology, the number of new molecular entities at the Food and Drug Administration were twice as high on an annual level as they are today. So productivity has decreased some 50 percent, and that's, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. But as that system, which, which hypothesized that we knew more than we did, and, and bet the, the farm on technology that would uh, robotically, exponentially uh, be able to screen millions of compounds against individual targets as if we thought the single target would cause a disease, that bet was a wrong bet. So we're, we're entering a phase of the dark ages of the dark side of the pharmaceutical industry where they'll have to get into other forms of businesses. And the most important thing is here in terms of my message to everyone here today is that population data is not suited well suited for the individual, and that's why the debate over what what, what nutritional plan is an anti-cancer plan will never be able to be answered because it, the answer is it depends on the individual. We've thought about these things, metabolic profiling. Uh, you you can hear some intelligence on that. You've heard about ABO diets because it's trying to get into an individual archetype. But it isn't as sophisticated as it will need to be in order to deal with us as an individual. And I'll just, and a good part of my, my lecture today deals with that. So the concept of layering multiple disciplines came to me, and that was the, that was the hypothesis that I formed on Atara Medicine under. And that was the experiment that I, that I wanted to, uh, to gain much more experience with, because I understood that for me and my family, this was the way to go, and that was the bet I was willing to, to take and make. As long as it was done safely, and as long as it took into, uh, into uh, account 
these different patterns that are listed here. And also take into the account of what Bert said. We have to take the emotional realm into account. We have to take the ener energetic realm into account. We have to take the electrical realm into account. We have to take all these into account because they're real. And we might as well not avoid it, certainly not in this community. But my, my fellow uh, uh, professors at UCSF aren't quite open, but they, they will need to open their minds to these things in the future. So we have, the, we have tremendous technology, and the technology is real, and there's no reason in the world not to use it, except in this case where the radiation exposure is tremendous. But, but the, the technology is, when you think about it, the technology is almost solely uh, observational. It isn't physiologically based. In this case, yes, you'll see which, which parts of your system is utilizing glucose at a faster rate so you can pick up tumors more likely, you know, more accurately, or, or inflammatory foci more accurately, but it's still observational. And then you have the emergence of the last two decades of MRI technology. Again, it's observational. Now, when you read an MRI of someone's knee, it takes about two pages. The, the radiographic report, radiology report of your knee anatomy, it takes about two pages to read because every, every single fiber of every single ligament is exposed. The question is, how do you avoid that level of degeneration? How do you avoid having furthering of the uh, osteoarthritic component of the knee? It's something as trivial as, relatively trivial as, as a joint versus the entire system is made more complicated by the observations, but the question is, what is the benefit of the extra observational power that we have? We can mine the data better, but the question is, what are we going to do with all this information? So, and the concept of CT scans, and and um, and I just I just sort of just smile every time I think about. Uh, I was probably 26 years old and having the chief of surgery of Albert Einstein Hospital come down and explain to me that he didn't understand how to read the CT scan, which was cross-sectional here, because he actually practiced the majority of his abdominal surgery through a very small incision. And it never occurred to me that surgeons do practice that way. They don't open everything up. So we were at the point of knowing so much, but actually not having real experience in the human body, although it, we have tremendous experience in the digital you know, manifestations of the human body. So it's the, the data that's coming from us we're, we're observing, but we have little knowledge of how to integrate it. So what do we have? We have the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and we have the, you know, the, the reason I showed this, and we all, we all have our biases, and some of us use pharmaceuticals more than others. Some of us are, are, are very against it. Uh, I've been a chief medical officer of a nonprofit pharmaceutical company. I understand how to, how to develop medicines. I understand about the FDA. I understand the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I, I put this on to really show the concept of when you take individual medicines f based on individual receptors, you're going to have to take a lot of medicines. Uh, for diabetes, there are 12 known molecular pathways today and some 50 or 60 diabetic medicines. There are three or four new pathways under, under uh, investi active investigation now, so there'll be 16 different molecular pathways to attack, quote unquote, a, a type 2 diabetic. So. Why doesn't one drug work? Well, because one drug is based on a single receptor, and this is a multi-gene expression, multi-receptor-based disorder. So you'll need to take a number of different drugs. The same goes for hypertension and for many, most of the other chronic disorders. So you'll need to take a number of drugs. The problem that, with that is, is that when you reach the sixth drug, the sixth or seventh medicine, you're guaranteed to have a drug-drug interaction. So at that point, you're going to be treating the eighth and ninth drug you'll be treating with is be the complications of the first six, and then that cycle is difficult to break. I will talk to you at the end of why our current field is perhaps even worse than this, because our current field, most of the patients coming to the center, bringing in their, their supplements in the basketfuls. 
So, so supplement to supplement interactions have to be taken into account. Most of us are not knowledgeable enough to understand the sum total of this yet, but the experience will grow. And so simplification, strategic thinking, um, uh, a plan that you can't address your entire body system at once in a single layer at one time, just taking the whole basket full of stuff and taking 50, 60, 70 medicines a day, supplements a day, is just not going to be an effective strategy. So one of my colleagues say at the university to me, when they talk to me, uh, they say, well, what's the evidence that all this nonsense with acupuncture works? Show me the randomized controlled studies. And so I come back and say a lot of other things. Just not to the. So we have really eminence based medicine today in the United States. The evidence based medicine is a good term, but it's largely deeply flawed because the committees that, that govern um, our, our standard standards of care in the United States are actually governed by fairly small committees. The committees are all chairmen of the departments, they're all funded by NIH, they're all funded by pharma. And they all have to do their research and fund their research in that way. And so there is a strong set of biases uh, f in, w embedded within our current system. And I think the, the data in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year or so ago stated that one in seven s definitive studies for the standard of care in the United States has been contradicted in future studies. So every time, about 15 some odd percent of times where the definitive standard of care is decided upon by a definitive study, it's contradicted later on. So show me that the concept of homeopathy works. How it's not possible, it's something that you cannot measure. Has, uh, so I said, well, okay, if you're gonna go to the, let's, let's take some of the definitive trials that have taken place in the United States. In this case, the largest study of women's health uh, uh, on estrogen use versus placebo. And uh, it was stopped very soon after the trial was begun because of the following risks uh, that, that this was again, this was based on trial, trial done, uh, studies done a decade before showing the benefits. So this now is the contradictory study is, that has now become the new standard of care and guides our current care. So it's declined over the, over the course around the world. But this study, the this, this, this same population had been studied 10 years earlier, um, over a 10 year period. So it started 20 years earlier and it was stopped 10 years before this started, reaching the opposite conclusions. So understanding that trial design is fundamental to, uh, to, to trial results. So understand that you can insert biases into any, any study if you want to show a result. And it can be done very, very cleverly. The concept is, is all, most of the men in the audience know uh, that total prostatectomy was overused in the United States and also used the, with the biggest variable of use of total prostatectomy was region in the United States as well as individual center. There were centers within a region that, that, that did no prostatectomies versus centers that, that had only done prostatectomies. So there was a tremendous set of biases built into the, the standard of care. And of course, we all know that this is gone, but this comes from the prior studies that showed the definitive nature of how important this was to, to the survival of, of pr prostate cancer. And then it was completely contradicted later on. So the concept that we're reading the New England Journal of Medicine as, as a biblical text, you understand that one in seven times it'll be contradicted. And the, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest issue that, that you all are, are very familiar with is the use of statins. Um, and as a cardiologist, um, having prescribed and been part of the research uh, apparatus at Hopkins that made statin use the standard of care in the United States, we now understand that, uh, uh, that about one in 100 people uh, get protected from an event. So it means 99 people are taking it uh, uh, without any particular profound in benefit, except we now know that if you extract lipids from certain organs, particularly the brain, you will have a higher prevalence of 
of dementia and other, other related disorders. And I think that that finding is going to be real. That finding is going to be real and ex partially explains the rise in, in so-called Alzheimer's or, 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 or amyloid plaque uh, derived uh, disorders of the brain. Um, and the reason I put this one on is, is because I have colleagues even in global health circuits, uh, but also in the United States, that want to create what's called a polypill. And the polypill is something equivalent of us putting certain pharmaceuticals in the water supply. So a polypill is a pill that you would give out to the general public. In this case, they wanted to do this in India, to give the Indian population uh, a, a safe antihypertensive and anti-lipid lowering drug in a in a in a and, and something that would protect against the further the future development of diabetes in the single pill, sort of whether you needed it or not. And this was so frightening to me that we have to work hard at dispelling the the benefits, particularly on the lipid side, which has been entrenched in the society for a long time. And then the concept of my colleagues who who put their research careers into fast track mode in genomics 25 years ago and said that genomics will be the, the answer to all of our ailments and all of our illnesses and all of our issues and all of our problems. Um, that hasn't borne out to be the case, and that's because of the level of complexity of, of our genome and the level of complexity of an average chronic illness may, may involve 100 genes interacting with one another, and it's not going to be possible to deal with it on a simple level. But then when you look at, when you think about it in terms of drug development, it will take us a few hundred years to, to replace our current pharmacopoeia with the new sets of medicines. So don't expect genomics to play a huge role outside of diagnostics over the next decade or two because we, know we won't be able to develop new molecular entities based on the genomic findings for at least 10, 15 years after they're, they're, they're discovered. So we have to think about the whole system and not just a symptom-based uh, uh, set of medicine or, 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 or an illness-based model. And whether or not we'll be, uh, we'll be treated by robots in the future, certainly immense databases are certainly going to be our reality. Genomics, all of this is yet to be seen, but I, I'm interested, as everyone else is here, in the present. So the question is not so much what the promise of medicine is going to be. The question is how do you use the best that there is available right now and use it, use it strategically for yourself and your family and the patients and the, and the people that are asking you questions. And, and I think that this is accurately true. As tra trained as some of you have been trained here in acupuncture, I think we can take the pulse of a person in that particular way, or whether it's an analysis on the homeopathic side or naturopathic side, more than any single digitized uh, technology that we have available today. And I think this is going to be uh, the case, um, despite genomics and proteomics companies uh, 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 starting left and right now for the, for the foreseeable future. I'm going to skip over this just for some of you who can write down the note and look up the Hood Group, this group based out of the Northwest, which is espousing the, the, the use of system biology in medicine. But if you look at it, that's a good thing. Uh, so they use predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory, which are very good four Ps. But they, they look at it from a computational perspective and using mathematical tools. They don't use uh, any evaluation on the patient. They're using patterning and, and chaos theory and so on, but they, they're not actually examining anyone or touching them or listening to them at all. So that's the level that we currently have in terms of, uh, in terms of where we are. So we're left with this level of complexity, and the question is what strategy we can use to, to address it. So going back to this, I thought I would take a few minutes and f focus on the things that we know the best. As a cardiologist, I feel comfortable talking about certain cardiovascular disorders that everyone in cardiology knows are the least understood 
of the un, of the most understood field in 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 in, in current medicine. So I want to address it, and I want to point out. Oh, so before I get to there, um, I had someone tell me that this was way too complicated, and and it was, although it was real, it was too hard to digest. So I just pulled the first article I could find and came up with this, which is obviously a lot less complicated, but seemingly still imperceptible because. This is just the component of, of certain cascades in the immuno, on the inflammatory cascade side, which is, again, still an immense level of complexity on every cell. So we're talking about NERF2. There are 500 known chemokines and cytokines. These are the messengers that talk between the immune system and the neurokine system, the nervous system, and the endocrine system. These are all receptor-based. 500 of them. I can put them on a single. I can put them on a single chip. And I have and I have developed with other colleagues the technology to do that. The question is what we would do with the data. We have no idea what we would do other than collecting massive amounts of information on people before and after they get treated by a holistic system-based approach. We wouldn't know what we were looking for because the if this is the orchestra, and the orchestra is composed of 500 individual uh, players, I'm the composer. Nerf 2 is one of the potential band leaders for the, for the violin section, for the string section. But one person blowing the buffoon over there, you know, blowing the, bas the, ba you know, the, the, the bassoon at very loud, sets the whole thing off. And when you look at this, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, pointed out to me that the new molecular entity that his company had just uh, developed was right here. <laughs> so he was really proud of that, that they had the receptor tagged and the, the, the molecule developed for it, but the interactions between the rest of the system are poorly understood, and that's why our drug, drug, inter our, drug inter our adverse events rise and rise as we go into the general population. And that's why the pharmaceutical approach is fundamentally simplistic and flawed. The, these models are more useful as we go forward. Here's actually, there's a patient up here, which is at least good. And uh, the concept of the future of regenerative medicine is clearly happening now. It's going to happen. It's going to dominate the medical uh, environment over the next uh, th th several decades. And it will be extremely cool and exciting. Uh, because, because the regenerative medicine really is based under the understanding that if we can give ourselves our basic youthful cells, our own system will auto will auto regulate on its own. If you don't have to understand the complexity, the complexity will take care of itself. But then we have artificial organs. We have all these novel things, and we have all of our basic uh, elements of academic medicine. But what it doesn't take into account is really what it means to be the patient and what it means to be the individual. And the next part of my talk, I want to address that, I think. I think that that's the next part of my talk. Although I have to thank Carmen for putting it together, but I, I haven't had a, a large amount of time to review it. So the concept of reestablishing homeostasis is the key, as many of you already know. But how do you think about it? Um, so one very simplistic way to think about it is you, you're born with a certain set of genetics and prenatal conditions. I just I don't believe that the genetics are fully um, uh, understood or, or exposed by our DNA. There may be multi-generational exposures and so on that, that are embedded into this system. But we're also born with a certain birth constitution. There are some babies who are just just unbelievably powerful and strong. Some babies that are not. Some children that have a lot of different, they're just cranky. they just low birth weight. They have whatever they have, they're just not as strong as others. So that gets ultimately treated and so on, and ultimately most of our children do very well. But you take your birth constitution with you your entire life, and I believe that there are traditions out there, uh, medical traditions out there that can address what everyone's birth constitution really is. And they're very useful in my particular practice, and I've been using it, and I'll, I'll describe it a little bit later. 
but the concept that you bring in some things into the world that you cannot, you can modify, but you cannot um, uh, fully uh, ignore. Again, we all know with, 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 with studies with twins, twins can, 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 can diverge dramatically in terms of their health because they have different exposures to environment and different ways to adapt to the environment. But in fact, you, they still have some basic DNA to have to deal with. What we put in, what we, what we, what we, how we eliminate, these are the detox pathways that we, that we all talk about. And then this concept of these environmental factors, again, th this is, these have been um, um, exploding in their, in their impact on our health. But also the concept of our own archetypes and how we handle our environmental stress and so on. So we have archetypes. Some of these archetypes from a German tradition are called temperament. This is the way we, we the, some of the lenses that we use to look at the world. We all have different lenses. Some of us are, are low energy, like Bert. <laughs> some of us are high energy. Some of us um, look at the world with vigilance. Some of us look at it with worry. Some of us look at it with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a joyful attitude. So we're all fundamentally different. But there are ways to look at those archetypes and then determine if there's a bio-emotional terrain that can be addressed in a strategic way. This is largely how homeopathy works. It, it, it looks upon you as patterning of symptoms, but also patterning of psyche and uh, your bioemotional terrain. There's different Chinese systems uh, uh, that deal with elements. The five element theory, which I, may, I won't have time to discuss today, but is the basis for Chinese, a wall of Chinese medicine a more ancient form than is currently used in China because Mao expunged it from the society as too elitist. But the two schools, the five element school of acupuncture and the five element school of herbalism was the basis for the 2000 year heritage. And it's all understandable and it all can be utilized as an individual way of understanding how we're all gonna treat the environment and our stresses differently. It also gives insights into the window of how to, which door to open first. So for example, if you go to a certain, cl certain clinics across the country, they say, well, the first thing you have to do is absolutely you have to eliminate. You have to de detox, you have to eliminate. And that's true for perhaps half the population. For half the population, that's too much. It's, the system cannot tolerate going straight into a detox form without first building up reserves. So these type of systems of approaches that are not based in straight uh, functional medicine or straight uh, you know, integrative medicine, the Andrew Weil type, are important. And then the, in the German and French systems, concepts that were born with certain paradigms, certain tendencies, they're called miasms, uh, they've, never been, uh, tr they've never been subject to good marketing skills because this is called a field called biotherapeutic drainage. It's one of the worst names I've ever heard and scares the hell out of anyone that I ever treat like that. But there's a number of patients here today, that p clients today that, that have and that understand what the value of these miastic categories or archetypes are because you don't make the error of treating someone in a way where, where it's going to be too much or, or it's not the first window that needs to be open. Because as the Chinese say, so, there are windows to the sky in our neck points, but sometimes if you open the window to the sky, it will blind the patient because the light is too, is too strong. So, is there, so when, you, when you're in a cave, you just stay in a cave for a few hours in, 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 in utter darkness, don't try to leave without, without sunglasses because you'll be blinded and it'll take you some time. And in the olden days, if, you, if that happened to you, you'd be eaten by a, by a boar or something. You, it, was a, it was something that really, they really took very seriously, that you couldn't tolerate something that was excessive. You had to do it in moderation. You had to do it in a layered fashion. There are many experts here more than I in terms of these elimination pathways, but su suffice it to say, I see a lot of patients from different, who've tried other centers, 
and the, the single thing that happened that, that, that messed, that messed things up is that they were treated too rapidly to try to, try to do too many things at one time. <coughs> so I also find that these types of patternings are important too. And this is sort of intuitively obvious, but unless you've ever gone to the doctors at UCSF or Stanford or any basic medical center, you understand that no one does an analysis like this uh, in, in the Western model on the medical side. Perhaps on the dental side, it, it's different. I'm not sure. And certainly on the chiropractic side, naturopathic side, it's completely fundamentally different. But in terms of the longer, the long lists of laundry list of symptoms are always coagulate, you know, they're always in a, in a row of, 10 to 15, a list of 10 to 15, but they're, they're not coherent. It's like up, upper respiratory cough, sinusitis, next to hypertension, next to diabetes, next to hyperlipidemia, next to arthritis. There's no rhyme or reason to it. There's no patterning involved. So you have to first go in the patterns. And so you end up with a list like something like this. And then you tick off on the list. And, and the, of course, the list comes in certain review of systems that the doctors check off and check off, but it's not absorbed on that level because no one knows, not too many people know how to use the data like this. But if you use it like this, you can, you can get a sense for which systems are more under duress than others. It doesn't necessarily give you the window as to what the initial insult was. And I'll explain what I mean by that and, and how, to, how to address it. But it does tell you which system is under more duress than others. I will tell you that one of the most fascinating studies I was involved in, right before I opened down Tower Medicine, I gained access to the Kaiser database as a consultant to Archimedes, who's a company that was formed by Kaiser to mine their data. Kaiser has the, the best digital data in the United States for longitudinal information over patient populations now over 30 some odd years. So we took 20 year data and asked the question of those patients that develop Alzheimer's disease now, what do they look like 20 years earlier? And what did they look like 10 years earlier? And this was an ex a fascinating, fascinating exploration. Because I can tell you that in that particular disorder, and there's many, going to be many, many, many others, the, the laundry list was really large. So the list of minor nuisance symptoms across these uh, different categories touched almost every category in, in a relatively minor nuisance way. Not, you know, hypertension treated, early diabetes treated, you know, weight loss required, you know, this and that, oh, sinusitis, headache, history of migraine, history of old asthma, these little nuisance things that could be addressed in a reasonable fashion by pharmaceutical agents, but really are signals that the system is suffering. And then 10, in this case now 20 years later, this is the dementia population. Of course, we took equal numbers of controls and the numbers were in these nuisance symptoms were, were, off by, were increased by a factor of two. So when you have these little things, Pay attention is the, le is the lesson because unless our brains get flushed every night, which they're not, for a variety of reasons, we're not we're no longer in control of the of our you know our lights our life cycles are no longer we're not in contact with these cycles any longer, and we're my kids sleep with their computers plastered next to their faces, and I always get uh, uh, um, I always get uh, uh, their their dismay when they wake up, realize that the computers are now left the room, so, you know, uh, inadvertently. But this is what's going on today. So we have to understand that these symptoms are not nuisance things; they're signals, and we have to address it. So I decided to address it in the following way: in the year 2010, 2011, and use these following things. On the clinical side, I want you to know that I am. Uh, knowledgeable enough in genomic work that I could understand it, so I use it. I use 23andMe on as many patients as possible because I know how to use it and it's useful to me. I think it would be a test that everyone in the audience should obtain. It's one of the best deals in town, $99. You understand certain things and 
only use it if you if you can tolerate knowing certain things but and that you're not going to get uh, upset and so on because everything is modifiable and more data you have in my opinion the better but looking at things on the physical side the eastern side the the of course there are more knowledgeable people than I am on the mind body side and of course on the nutritional side uh, many people have devoted much more time in their careers than I have. But I do have a particular approach that I want to discuss a little bit later. And then I've added oxidative medicine and then, and then regenerative medicine to the list. Because I've always been looking for system-based approaches, and oxidation, and you heard from Dr. Rowan last month, uh, uh, and Dr. Schallenberger uh, out in Reno, these brilliant practitioners and observational s scientists, as I call them, have added a great deal to our experience. And having exposure to something as reparative on a global system level as, as, as oxidative therapy is an important part of our basic repair strategy at, at the clinic. But sometimes you have to go the stem cell route, and I'll show you an example of that. And that, that will become much more commonly uh, used in the future as the prices come down. So. If everyone's so unhappy, how come? Uh, so, what is the industry doing to to ensure our loyalty? So they're talking about these catchwords. They're using the word personalized, and personalized really means it has nothing to do with you. It, they, they don't they don't have to see you. They need to see your genomic data, as if your genomic data is going to magically lead to to a therapy you know to therapeutic decisions. But of course, we're not there yet just like we don't have a tricorder yet, although there are many companies working on it. So it, it doesn't mean you. Uh, and it has to be precise. That means that you get the right medicine at the right time at the right dose. But we only make certain doses forms. We don't make an infinite variety. And I would, I would venture to say that if I was expanding my concept of the nonprofit pharmaceutical sector, that I would treat diabetes in a fundamentally different way on the pharmaceutical side if I wanted to do that way. I would take six of the molecular pathways, do very, very low dosing on each of the six pathways, and then combine in a single pill for very low dose. And I would treat you that way. The trouble is I can't do that because no one would fund it, number one. Number two is, is as the new therapies come on board, they come from different companies, so you cannot, you cannot combine them that way. So it's never going to be truly personalized. And, of course, it will be high tech. So that's, that's the cool thing. So you'll end up... So this, the old story will continue. And then the story gets um, expanded upon in the following way. They, they say these are, these are the methods that we're going to, we're going to, you're going to receive tumor-specific therapies. Well, we have one, two tumor-specific therapies available in the United States today, but that's about it. We don't have much robustness in this field yet, again, because we, we fundamentally lack the, the decision-making 30 years ago that would require us to look at the system as a whole. If you don't know, about 30 years ago, a decision was made that d d disorders would be ultimately broken down into individual receptors, and that's the way we would do it. So they stopped testing, they stopped testing for efficacy in animal models. They used animal models... They continue using it for toxicology purposes. So for adverse events, yes, even though there's no relationship, but they use it still. But the, uh, but the concept that a drug could work in an animal in toto was lost. So then they develop robotic technology. So you could screen a million compounds in an evening against a specific target out of your library of 100 million compounds and then come up with the top million. And then the chemist would get to work on the top ones that would be screened further and further down. But it would never be used in an animal system until the very late in the process. And this, is, this has been um, largely the, the, main, the main damaging effect of the loss of productivity. So we have to go into these other things, but we're not there yet. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, show uh, a picture of a large uh, bird-like animal with his head in the, ground, in the sand. But I chose this instead because it sort of has certain visual characteristics. So if you're looking to be saved by robotics, then you'll end up 
with this. This is what this is this is the this will be the best of the best. This will be the surgical technique that'll work, but you require the surgery. And in this case, there won't be there won't be any human intervention because in this particular company that made the slide that talked about the future of medicine TED conference that I attended and spoke at a few years ago, this this was done uh, at a distance. And there was a case in CPMC Hospital uh, some about two years ago where the robotics um, machine froze. And there was no way to turn it back on uh, for about two, three hour period. And it was scary. It was a scary situation. But again, very precise form of medicine, but it's not exactly preventative. So the concept of using these four Ps is really the, the concept that needs to be had. So what do you do to use prediction? So we have certain tests now. So some, some of you in the audience have had these tests, have come to the clinic and have these tests and go to other clinics. The concept's that we're gonna, we're gonna have an explosion in diagnostic technology that'll tell you what your risk is. It won't tell you how to deal with that risk. It'll tell you what your risk is, and it's gonna explode over the next 10 years, even more so than it has been today. So look for that. But understand that you still need a strategy of what I'm going to do about it. Because our, our concepts of what na natural remedies will be interacting with, with our disorders and our different risks will also explode. So we'll have Bernd tell us another 100 good ideas over the next year that will all not be able to integrate it so easily because we can't try 100 new med medicines at a time. So these are the different things, and, and I'll, I'll look at that. I mean, the, these aren't so important. But the concept of being preventative and personalized from a functional medicine point of view are well known to this audience, and I don't have to address it here. Um, but this is the, the basis of preventative and personalized medicine as we know it here in this type of uh, audience. And the concept of naturopathic medicine is well known to this type of an audience. And, and I think is a, a much safer approach using the biomarker testing, using the risk assessment tools that we have. But then how do we get personalized is the question. And, uh, and that's the, 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 so how do we get personalized like this? And, I, and I'm afraid that I, I think that um, Adrian and I were talking about this on the way here. And you know, the question is, well, what about me? And I have to say that there is no black and white answer because, because you have to be truly evaluated. It isn't like something, oh, I could tell, you know, I could just look at you and tell, because I'm not an, an intuitive uh, and I'm not, uh, you know, a, a seer. But, but all of us have to have that type of strategy in mind in terms of how we're going to get individualized. So let's take two, two examples. Um, in terms of the disorders that we know better than any others. So here we have the, the cardiovascular risk family, which is, again, the, the largest killer in the United States. Um, and we're mainly unfamiliar with the risks. Uh, we don't get tested in early enough. So one of my clients is going to, um, going to uh, join a concierge practice in the East Coast. And part of the thing, you, know, you pay X thousands of dollars a year to be part of the practice. And part of the thing is, is that they're going to expend, anyone who joins this, this concierge practice gets half hour appointments instead of 15 minute appointments. So in that half an hour, which it takes me about, about that amount of time to write your name down and understand what your real complaints really are, that's going to be it. So you're going to get that type of level of care on the concierge level. But it's not going to be that that it's not going to be that effective. Um, so these these myths, the mythology that I talked about uh, before, is still pervasive. So the concept of inflammation, as as many of you know, as being a central feature of our pathology today, our explosion in pathology today, whether it's our cardiac status, or uh, digestive systems, or metabolic systems is truly important and, um, and truly key. 
So this was a reasonable cartoon, I thought. Um, I have some bad news. Well, your cholesterol remains normal. The research findings have changed. So you can, <laughs> you can have your lipids normal and still get, get smitten uh, because that's not the story. The story is um, a fusion between lipids, inflammation, and psychoemotional forces. Uh, we cannot explain why the mortality rate following cardiac surgery is fivefold increased in patients in the first year than patients who are depressed. We cannot explain that in any, in any way other than you want to go down the route of adrenal stress and pro-inflammatory stresses, of course, and that leads to more th prothrombotic states and so on. But th these are important things. So the concept of our immunomodulation, I'd say the, the, the biggest driving force of modulating your, your immune system will be NERF-2 agonists, will be oz oxidative medicine, uh, will be high doses of vitamin C on occasion when you can get the intravenous infusions, will be vitamins A, D, E, K2 in combination in some formulation that your body can accept. Sometimes when it's, when it's wrapped in cellulose, you will feel sick and you hadn't sick, weren't sick before because you're now sensitized to cellulose. Like, the, like many, many people in the population are, and that's why they're getting sicker with every s supplement they're taking, because they can't tolerate the sensitivity to that particular protein. But the, dr the biggest driver is lifestyle, lifestyle changes. So there are experts in the audience that I'm looking at right now in terms of metabolic systems and nutritional systems. I mean, th these are the things that will modulate your immune system more than any single other, per, you know, any other single strategy. And that's why it doesn't sell big. And then you then you say, well, I want to know what nutrition I want. What, what do you recommend for me? And we have people who are very strict vegans and vegetarians, who who are very very healthy and wonderfully adapted to it, and and are doing fabulously well. And others that are having gone through that type of a, of a detox system, have uh, gone much, much worse because they're not suited for that particular type. I know, does anyone here have uh, irregular heartbeats? No, whatever, so this is one of the major gaps in, in, in cardi cardiology uh, because this is, a, this is something that is very difficult to tease out. And the reason it's difficult to tease out and the reason that it's poorly done poorly on the medicine side is because it's a system disorder and the last the last manifestation of which is your irregular heartbeat but the steps involved are are tremendously are easy to understand but complicated and not sort of obvious so here is where where what it looks like instead of having a, a sinus rhythm you're going into a chaotic rhythm Cha chaos in certain traditions on the european side are very important the term chaos is very important because cancer is chaos, uh, you know, metabolic chaos and, and elimination pathway chaos. But on the cardiac side, I'm not saying cardiac disease is cancer, but I'm saying that it is, it is the chaotic version of, of, uh, of, of that same type of system pathology. And so it's, it's one of these disorders that, has the, that you can get from any variety of different indications. And I have this CEO that comes in with a family history of atrial fibrillation. He had these atrial premature beats back in college. And then he developed paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. That means he gets atrial fibrillation on occasion uh, when, when he starts this new company. And then he's treated with aspirin. And then the company has a takeover attempt, and he has a stroke. But all these chads and so on, I, didn't have I don't think we want to go over these scores. These, these, um, these predictive scores were insensitive to his increased risk. He said, well, why me? You know, why did this happen? How is it possible? I'm taking an aspirin. It's like the guy who used to ask me, how come I need cardiac surgery, doc, when I was uh, in Hopkins? And he says, I, I'm, I'm just stunned that I need cardiac surgery. This was back in, in the late 80s. He goes, I, I eat a banana every day. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my commitment to my health. I mean, my commitment is so strong. How is it possible that I need cardiac surgery? I mean, 
I mean, I'm taking an aspirin a day. I mean, this should have taken care of this nonsense, nuisance symptom. But it took him down with a stroke. But he had family history. He had the genetic part. He had the first onset of symptoms even when he was a teenager. So a long-standing stress response. When you asked him when you got it, he says, doing final examination. Um, but ultimately, when he became an adult, his stress component wasn't paroxysmal, only his atrial fibrillation was. He had inflammatory markers. He, he had sort of moderate, mild, moderate obesity uh, after being a lifelong athlete. His diet was pro-inflammatory, and he needed a system-based approach. So basically what he needed was a look in his system on the stress axis side, on the inflammatory side, on the, on the cardiac side in terms of ischemia and microcirculation, as well as metabolism and the global circulation. And without that, <coughs> atrial fibrillation will increase and is now triple in prevalence as compared to when I trained in, in, in cardiology. So the three, three times more people now with atrial fibrillation than before, and that's because it's a system-based disorder, and our systems are becoming more toxic. So how does someone like this need to be treated? They need to be treated with, with some, some understanding of their archetype, S some get off your ass and stop worrying about your company and start worrying about yourself because you won't be able to enjoy it. Some concept of tempering your mind at night, in particular so you sleep properly, then have some kind of individualized nutritional program, and then have a naturopathic approach, preferably with some archetypal thing. And one of the things I want, if I have time to talk, otherwise I'll talk in the question Q&A period, of, of a system of medicine that we follow in the, in the clinic based out of Korean Sasung medicine. Sasung medicine is a very individualized form of medicine and can determine your constitutional archetype that you're born with that would be suited to eat certain foods versus others. Certain people in the audience live like that. I, I, I do. And it's very, very accurate and, and it can be very effective and is most effective when you're trying, when you're not very ill because Eastern medicine doesn't understand the need for our level of gut repair that we have now. They don't understand food sensitivities as to the extent that we currently have it. So if you are relatively well and you want to prevent things, understand which of the many different diets will be best suited for you. Certain people get sick using paleo. Some people would, 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 won't do well without a paleo diet. And we have to understand the individualization. So when you look at atrial fibrillation under the microscope, which I understand, you find certain things. This is, of course, at autopsy. This is not from a live person. But you understand this, this blue is the scarring in that part of the atrium and part of the, the, the heart that is responsible to generate the, 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 the beat, the regular beat. So this is a degenerative condition that is affecting that, that part of the heart. And then there's an inflammatory component. You can see with all these little dots, these are little lymphocytes. So what are they doing there? What are they doing in the heart? There's no particular viral illness here. It's just there. Well, it's, it's there, but there's an inflammatory component as well. And then there's a vascular component. These blood vessels here have scarring around it. This person had no hypertension, so it's unexplained. So something is going on in terms of the... This is where the lymphatics in the heart are. So something going on in the lymphatic circuit that's not properly uh, eliminating things within the heart, just like we're not eliminating properly in the brain. So our explosion in heart disease and brain disorders are because our lymphatics and our microcirculation aren't adapting well to the toxicity. It's certainly acidic qualities. Our, our, our systems are gunked up, and we don't have a mechanism, easy mechanism to address that. One of my favorite discussions is just, I'm going to take, I think we're targeting at 9 o'clock? No, no. Now? Oh, okay. 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 So for, for the people who say, listen, I just want you to just tell me what I need to do um, and stop giving me these complex um, diagrams. I say, well, think about yourself as a Porsche. Most guys love that. And uh, think about yourself that you need to be regularly monitored. And think about the concept that your wiring needs maintenance. 
these are simplistic ideas, but without that, this thinking strategically and understanding what your basket of things that you have on your, on your bathroom window are trying to address and trying not to address them all at once is really going to be pivotal to come up with an individual plan for yourself. I had a lot more slides, but I do want to come to, yeah, it's the concept of the immune rigidity is, is I just wanted you to be aware of this concept because I, as an immunologist, am <coughs> totally blown away by the, uh, by the increased prevalence of all these disorders. And to the large extent, a lot of my practice deals with these disorders, and to a large extent, the people with these disorders have long laundry lists of symptoms, have the same type of things that I'm worried about 20 years later for them. And if we don't address them, we're going to have to uh, deal with other consequences. Um, these are, this is one of, the, one of the, the quotes that I like to use, too, uh, that was addressed in an earlier conversation during our, uh, during our opening statements. I think that it's important. Um, I will tell one story, and and uh, and uh, the concept of uh, I do want everyone to be aware of this. In the United States, there's no more primitive form of medicine than oncology. Fundamentally primitive, uh, fundamentally unchanged from 1970, when uh, Professor Nixon declared the war on cancer, it's fundamentally not different, and. You have to understand that there are tools out there that I'm aware of, and some of you, clearly some of you are as well in the audience, that when you, when you have a tumor and you address it in, in a specific way, um, you have to have a strategy of following yourself. Because our current system deals only with the observation of whether you have the mass or you don't have the mass. It talks nothing about your risk of future your future risk, it talks nothing about your current load of your cells that aren't embedded in the mass but are circulating in your body. So we knew about circulating tumor stem cells 30, 40 years ago. And we had the means to measure them 30, 40 years ago because all these stem cells have certain, um, uh, these microbeads or fluorescent beads that are targeting the cell surface. So we knew how to immunophenotype these. We knew well, the histochemistry was available 40 years ago. But there isn't a single laboratory in the United States that measures these circulating tumor cells. So we have to ship our, our, our uh, samples to Greece, to the best laboratory I feel in the world, although there are a few others in, in Europe, that will measure these tumor cells in anyone with a tumor or in someone like, uh, like a 60-ish year old male who wants to know whether he has circulating tumor cells on the prostate side. Because I certainly don't want anyone to biopsy my prostate, because uh, I don't want I don't want the, the 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 risk of it spreading, and so these type of technologies do not exist here, but they do exist elsewhere, and I think we have to begin using them. And I I had two examples of how it was used, but it has to be used. And the other thing I wanted to close with, because uh, I won't be able to show the stem cell uh, video that I wanted to show, but there there is a growing there's a growing interest in, in using um, different forms of technology um, that you could just have as part of your day-to-day -day life. And part of it is these molecular-based oxygenated waters. And it's not clear to me it has anything to do with the oxygen. It may be doing with the way the, 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 the water is prepared. These are electrolytic forms of oxygen. These are, ox these are beverages. These are waters that are exposed to different uh, electrical systems. There's one nanotechnology here that produces nanobubbles, and I think the nanobubbles have electrical charges and enter into the Krebs cycle. Uh, enter and become your oxygen utilization becomes more um, um, uh, efficient. So we have oxidative medicine, but we'll also have different things. And then Bert's uh, uh, technologies in the future that he, he's more adept at than I am in terms of the electrical system. System wide system wide approaches have to be layered on to individual vitamin supplements. I mean, you can go down the K2, A, D, E, Bs. Some of you are sensitive to them, some of you are not, but you need a system-wide approach. So you need something that will increase your oxygen utilization. 
you need certain things that work on the system level. This was the genius of Linus Pauling and the orthomolecular folks back in the olden days that I know very little about and many of you know a lot more about. But these, the genius was look at the whole system as a whole. These are all going to be, this list next year will be double and in five years we'll, we'll take up the entire page. There will be more directed system-wide approaches. It's not going to come from pharma. It's going to come from the consumer-driven markets. The data are going to be lousy, but you're going to have to try it. As long as it's safe, you'll figure out which ones work best for you. And I don't think there's any other approach because one thing that, that we don't do well in the alternative world is we don't collect data well. And we don't, we don't have a way, a mechanism. We don't have the machinery to do it. We don't have the funding to do it. Uh, and, and so you have to take individual uh, um, incentive and, and, uh, and, and do it on your own. So I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Elise. First question. Um, oh, hold on. Okay. Test, test. Um, what about epigenetics? In 23andMe, everybody thinks that the gene profile is set in stone, and I'm not convinced whatsoever. And therefore, uh, basing uh, protocols and, and yeah. diagnoses, et cetera, et cetera, on how your genes come out, I don't know is how valid. No, no, but I, I completely agree. Everything on the right side of that the core diagram was all epigenetics. So. All of that was the, the terrain. Yeah, it's just I find a lot of that, people. But to, that is the term epigenetics. That is your genetic uh, interaction, your, your interaction with your genes, with your environment. Everyone's writing books about you know, the ill population with methylation pathways being disturbed. But in routine life, when we're not critically ill, th this, is how, this is the reality. The reality is, is that our genetics roughly explain in mathematical models, roughly 10 to 15 percent of our of our expression of the disease. The rest of it, 85 plus percent, is determined by our our interaction with the environment. So epigenetics dominates, um, and uh, I think that's fairly clear to me. And th that's what the data suggests: around 80, 80 to 90 percent. Yeah, we don't have much time for questions, so. You had a, a thing on one of your slides, like population data is not usually suited to the individual. Yes. But there's a book, The Blue Zones, where the several neurologists went around the world to find people in what countries live to be 100 years old. Now, if you copy what they do, their diet, you know, uh, their thinking, their exercise, I, I think you have a better chance to being healthy and living to 100, yes. and none of them saw doctors, and yes. none of them took any medicine. And, they, and there's four countries where they all live to be 100. Yes, and, but you're <laughs> right. You're, you're, I, I, I'm in complete agreement. You will do, a lot, you'll do better if you follow that model, eating natural, you know, in, the, in those type of systems. But I'm, what I'm just saying is there is no such thing as the average patient. The average patient is, 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 a, is, a, is a statistical term. The mean, who's the median patient? Who's that patient in the center? There is no such, this is a fictional thing. There is no average patient. So this, you should understand that, that the average patient, uh, when you use the average, when you use the pharmaceutical model, remember an outstanding, an outstanding result is 30% efficacy. Because you need about 30% to beat placebo. Because placebo rough, roughly works 25% of the time. So you need 30% to, to beat it. But, uh, but when you do beat it, you're not beating it for the other 70% because there is no such thing as an average patient. I, I was, I was, when I came here, when I saw your leaflet, I was hoping to hear about how you practice yes. and something about cell therapy. So would you be willing to come back and tell us how you do it? Yeah, it's just, just impossible to do it in a short period of time. Of course, I'd be thrilled to do that. That's probably a lecture all in itself. So, All right, thank you, Dr. Avi, for...